Well, good evening, everyone. I didn't know whether to dance with that, but I'm not an island boy, so I don't know what to do. What a wonderful privilege to be together here in God's house. Many of you come from very, very far. Some of you are tired, but we have gathered here for a purpose. And that purpose is to experience the presence of the living God. The reason why we have come here is to be transformed into His likeness. The reason why we have come here is to have some of those things that bind us, that keep us down to be broken. And most of all, we have come here because the living God who lives within us wants to be unleashed. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to give Him our insecurities, our fears, our inhibitions. He wants us to trust Him that He is God. As we've been worshiping here this evening, I've been blessed. Have you been blessed? Yes. yes. Some of you have not been blessed. <laughs> Some of you have not been blessed because you've never worshipped like that before. And you will continue to not be blessed unless you trust God unless you trust God. We have been molded and formed into the beings that we are. We have experienced worship or spiritual disciplines or whatever in our up upbringing. But maybe God wants to break that mold and during the course of this week, He wants to set you free. I feel God challenging me with this quote. We, the people of the Asia-Pacific region, are to become a movement of God. Do you hunger and thirst to be a movement of God? Do you want to see the Holy Spirit work in and through your life? Some of you do. Praise God. My hope is that by the end of these days together, that you will become a movement of God. We want... On this region, we want a movement of God through the people of God. Let me say that again, a movement of God through the people of God. That means we need to set Him free. We have planned this conference. We've spent a lot of time praying and reflecting on the theme. And we've decided upon this theme, unleash the power. Unleash the power. I believe that the power of God that is within us wants to be unleashed. And that we need to trust Him. The theme for this event is broken out over four days, and we heard that in the video I encourage you to participate, to go and learn and be challenged and motivated and inspired. This evening, I've been given the responsibility of launching this event with the concept of the power of God. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, and this is the theme verse of our conference, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. 
you will be my witnesses. The word that immediately jumps out, and that is the theme of the conference, is power. Power. It's a term that has so much history, so much baggage. See, when I think of power, I think of position. I think of generals in the armies that have position, and with position comes authority, and with authority comes power. You speak, they listen. If they don't listen, there are consequences for the lack of obedience. Power. When I think of power, I think of privilege. There are people in privileged positions who make decisions on behalf of other people. And that influences the lives of individuals. When I think of the word power, I think of control. People who have been given responsibility and with that responsibility, they abuse their responsibility and they control people. The result of these things is often domination, abuse, despair. In fact, if you turn the news on and you watch the news, you will see that governments posture one against the other, threatening, menacing. We see social structuring happening, where you have the haves living here and the have-nots living there. You see economic and educational systems put in place that some will never be able to access. Power. If you read the definition, you'll see that even the definition is clear that it is the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. Power is control. So this evening during this launch service, as we reflect on the power that will come upon you, we know that this, these things that I have just cited, is not the power of God, but it's the power of man. And let me just pause you for a moment and say that unfortunately, in the history of the church, in the history of Christianity, we have seen the church abuse power. We have seen the church posture itself and dictate and dominate to individuals that have harmed and hurt and driven people away from Christ. The very body of Jesus himself has been rejected because of the institution that we have created. If we are to be the people of God, anointed and filled with the Spirit of God, then we ought to be like God. So when I think of this power, you will receive power. I'm reminded of four things, four areas of power. When I think of this power that will come upon me and the origin of this power, I think of the Creator God Himself. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. Wow! What kind of God is this? This is the Almighty God. This is the Creator God. This is the God who spoke and everything came into existence. If you walk out here at night, it's nice and dark, and it's cloudless, and you look up in the sky, 
you will see this incredible display of the universe. Our Creator made this. When we look at the trees and nature around us, we see the hand of God. When we look at each other, what do we see? We see a human being created in the image of God. When the disciples were afraid in the boat, what happened? God spoke. Jesus spoke. And he controlled the storm. You will receive power. The Creator God will come upon you. This God who created. When I think of power, the power of God, I think of the power of the cross. The power of the cross. Power in the striving for power has been an ambition of man since the beginning of time. In fact, if we read Genesis 3, 5 carefully, we will hear the temptation. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The temptation to power. The temptation to be like God. And because man continues to desire and pursue this, we have been lost. How can I save myself from my egotistic natures, nature, from my desire to be like God, from my desire to be Lord of my own life? for my desire to be saved. How can I do it in my own strength? I cannot. But God has, through the power of the cross, through the power of the resurrected Christ, through the power of the open grave, I have been redeemed. I have been saved. And this power in the work of the cross continues its work in you and in me as we are regenerated, as we are made more and more in the image of Jesus Christ. So when the power of God is unleashed upon us, it's not that we might have the power to do what we want to do, the power to speak to nature and calm the storms and pray that rain would come down like some miracle worker, or that we would have the power to save someone. No, the power of God that comes upon us is an unseen power at work within us that changes us and transforms us into His likeness. If we will trust Him and let Him do His work. Not only am I saved through the power of the cross, I am reborn, I am made anew. Changes happen in me that I have no control over. We were just interviewing some missionaries yesterday. And one of those missionaries gave us his testimony of how God has changed and transformed his life. And in his testimony, he says, I know what I was. And today, I'm nothing like that person, but I don't know how it happened. How did it happen? Because he followed a long list of rules and regulations. How did the transformation happen? It happened because of the power of God that was transforming him and changing him, cleansing him, changing bad habits. The power of God in regeneration. The power of God in incarnation. 
The doctrine of the incarnation, as we know, is our belief that the second person of the Trinity, that is Jesus himself, assumed human form. And he's completely both God and man. It has been said that if the church is to be truly the church, the church must incarnate Christ and manifest the kingdom of God in its life. We must incarnate the holiness of God. We must be holy, for He is holy. We have been called into a loving and personal relationship with our Creator. And we are called by His holy incarnation, Jesus Christ, to be agents of His incarnation. How do we do it? Through Christ who lives within us. We are called to care for the sick, to visit the imprisoned, to defend the poor and the homeless, to preach the gospel to all nations, to serve as peacemakers. We are called to be merciful and to be quick to forgive. We are called to lay down our lives for others and incarnate the mercy and love of God. My friends, Christ must be exhibited in our lives on a daily basis. It's not enough that we know, but it's important that we do. And how can we do when I am weak, when I don't want to get up in the morning, when I don't want to do things? How? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This saving, transforming, renewing, sanctifying power. I am crucified with Christ. Is this you? Can you say it? I am crucified with Christ. Some of you think you are. Can we say it again? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Can we say that? Christ lives in me. Who lives in you? Christ lives in you. How does Christ live in you? Does He live just a little bit in you? Did you give Him just one little room of your heart? Or is He living fully in you? Freely in you, powerfully in you, miraculously in you, redeemingly in you. How is Christ living in you? In your own strength, we can limit His capacity to do all that He desires to do. We are made partakers of the divine nature, receiving and sharing God's own nature through His promises. And all of Almighty God is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the Almighty God is ours. Do you know that? As I reflect on power, As I reflect on this vision that God has given us, this passion to become a movement of God through the people of God, I am drawn by the importance or to the importance of prayer. In Second Chronicles seven fourteen, it says, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, not humble themselves and do more good works, not humble themselves and study more theology, not humble themselves and do more devotional practices, but if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Oswald Chambers says that prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. If we want the power of God to be unleashed upon us, friends, we must be a people of prayer. If we look at our Lord Jesus, in His most trying moments, in His most difficult moments, what did He resort to? Prayer. Prayer. There is power in prayer. We need to pray. Prayer is the battle, and it makes no matter where you are, we need to pray. Roland Hearn, our FSC for Australia and New Zealand, in his report to the RAC, he wrote these words, the church is perceived as an antiquated construct overt, overly committed to maintaining structures of power and authority that benefit the few and constrain the marginalized to their fate. Let me read that again. The church is perceived. In other words, when we say the church, this is the institution that people perceive. We as Christians, we know the church is not the building. It's not the institution registered as a corporation somewhere. But the church is the people of God. Yet the church is perceived as an antiquated construct. In other words, we are we out of touch with reality. Overly committed to maintaining structures of power and authority that benefit the few and constrain the marginalized to their fate. The world may think this way, but we know something different. And if we really think differently, then I pray that this conference and the workshops and the plenary sessions will challenge you and will cause you to break down the walls and the boxes and the constructs that you have about who the church is. The church is a living entity. We know that for 2,000 years, the enemy of God has been trying to silence the people of God. That is the church. <coughs> but as Gamaliel said in Acts chapter 5, I advise you, Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourself fighting God. My friends, for 2,000 years now, they've been trying to stop the church. But the church is unstoppable because Jesus said, I will build my church. The church is unstoppable. Oh, yeah. Do you really believe that? The church is unstoppable. The enemy has not been able to stop the church. Why? Because since the day that Jesus sent the 12 out, giving them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, they have been doing that, taking nothing with them for the journey. 
when we go trusting, taking nothing with for the journey, but trusting Him to provide us with all that we need, we will experience the fullness of His provision, the power of God that came upon them on the day of Pentecost. Not only was it a promise, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it happened. Hallelujah! The power of God came upon them, and they were never the same. Church of the Nazarene, Asia Pacific. I desire to know the fullness of God. I hunger and thirst after His righteousness. My prayer for us as a church <coughs> is that we will not just be good academically, that we will not just have a heart knowledge, that, uh, a head knowledge, that, that we will not just want to do good things, but that we will do things in and through the power of God because we trust Him, because we are obedient to Him. If you look at Scripture, if you look at the teachings of Jesus, there are two areas of focus, obedience and compassion. How we love in response manifests itself in compassion, in love. Are we as a church, locally from where you come, district where you serve, nationally where you live, are we trusting Him? Are we surrendered to Him? Are we desiring Him? In these days, as we worship together, as we pray together, and just FYI, we have a prayer room, 1901 of the Garden Wing or whatever it is out there. There's a prayer room. And if you need prayer, go. There'll be someone there in the morning and the evening to pray with you. I know some of the field teams have taken the challenge to heart that we become a people of prayer. They are going to be praying. This conference, for 30 weeks before the conference, we have been praying that the Spirit of God would come upon us, His people, that we would be transformed, changed, never the same again. Do you hunger for this? Do you desire this? My friends, I hope so, for that is why we are here. George and his worship team are here during these corporate sessions to lead us into the presence of God in worship and in Scripture, and I want us to let go. I want you to trust God. I want you to let go. Trust God to do something new in you. May our verse, our theme verse, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, not be a verse that just points back to 2,000 years ago, May it not be a verse that we say, oh, that, that was to those disciples. But may it be a verse that we claim for ourselves during this event. That the power of God, that God Himself 
that God himself would come upon us and empower us and change us into his likeness for his honor and glory that his kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven.